Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about memory allocation. Memory allocation is not only an operating system problem, but a general problem that virtually all programmers will face. Nearly every piece of software you'll ever write needs some form of dynamic memory allocation, and understanding how it works can have a big impact on performance. In this first part of the lecture, we're going to look at malloc and some of the trade-offs between fragmentation and performance that we can make when designing an allocator and think about how this is gonna impact applications. Almost all software uses dynamic memory allocation and this is because it eases the development and it often improves functionality. For example, we don't have to statically specify complex data structures. We can also have data grow as a function of input size all because of dynamic memory allocation. The problem with this is that dynamic memory allocation often can have a huge impact on performance. Some of the highest performing server applications are designed to eliminate memory allocation in the critical code path to maximize performance. So today, we'll focus a little bit about implementation techniques and understand the trade-offs that'll help you understand performance problems when it comes to dynamic memory allocation in your applications. There's a few interesting things about allocators that might be surprising. The first is that really small code changes can have often non-obvious and sizable impacts to the performance in terms of memory overhead and CPU overhead for allocators. And also, it's been proven, and we'll use this throughout the lecture today, that it's impossible to construct an always good allocator that's gonna perform well for all applications. This means that often you'd like to customize allocators for different purposes. In operating systems, because performance and because of the particularities of those workloads, we often find that most operating systems have multiple allocators. They'll have a page allocator to allocate physical memory. They'll have malloc and free that can be instantiated in separate pools for different portions of the operating system, and often a slab allocator that we'll talk about today, which is another type of allocator specialized for allocating lots of individual structures of the same type. And the last is that memory management is still poorly understood because a lot of this depends on application behavior and understanding how these different applications behave in modern operating systems. And this is a constantly evolving problem. So let's see quickly, why is it hard to build an allocator? So we can arbitrarily satisfy a bunch of allocations and freeze. It's really easy to do this without freeing any memory. So the most basic allocator we can have is what's known as a bump allocator. And this is sometimes actually used as a building block for certain types of allocators, where we allocate blocks of memory on demand by calling malloc. And all we have is a pointer to the current free position. And we'll bump that pointer every time we allocate some number of bytes to the next free position. This makes it incredibly fast to do allocations often just a couple cycles. The problem with this obviously is that we can't easily free arbitrary memory inside of this heap. We'd have to free the entire heap or free things in reverse order from the allocations. So if we think about it, the stack works a lot like the bump pointer. There are other examples where bump pointers are used. Some very high performance allocators for garbage collection so think of languages like Java, JavaScript, where there is dynamic memory allocation, but the free is done automatically as part of the program language runtime. In these cases, sometimes a bump allocator is used within pools of memory, and then the garbage collector takes care of copying that memory over to another location and freeing all those things lazily in the background. So the problem though, as you should be able to see already, is that every time you free things in this allocator, we're creating fragmentation 
we're creating gaps of free space that maybe we can use in the future and maybe we can't. And over time, it can be very difficult to satisfy re memory requests if we end up with lots and lots of fragmentation. Let's look at this a little more abstractly. At a high level, the allocator has one or more free lists. These free lists contain lists of blocks that are free that it can hand to the application. In a sense, the allocator needs to track the memory that's in use and what parts are free. And it should ideally do this with no wasted space and no time overhead. What it can't do is control the number and size of the requested free and malloc operations. It can't move allocated regions after it's given them to the application. This isn't true for garbage collectors that we'll touch on later in the, in the lecture but generally for dynamic allocation, this is true. And the core fight is gonna to be to minimize fragmentation and do this efficiently. So imagine that the application can free blocks in any order, creating holes in the heap, and we wanna make sure that those holes aren't too small that we can't satisfy future requests. So here in this example, we've allocated a bunch of blocks, we try to malloc 20, and we can't really satisfy it because we have these two blocks of 10, but they're not adjacent to each other that we could combine them back to a block of 20. What is it that leads to fragmentation? And broadly speaking, fragmentation falls into one of two main categories. First, it comes from different lifetimes for objects. We allocate a bunch of objects and we free only every other object immediately and others get freed in the future. This will create holes throughout the heap. If we freed and them all at the same time, then we wouldn't really see fragmentation. We'd have pools of memory that get allocated and freed almost atomically. This also stems from different sizes of allocation. If we always allocated the same size object, then we could just have an array of that object and hand those out to the application. And this is the basic idea behind the slab allocator that we'll touch on later in the lecture. So what are the main important decisions? There are three main sets of decisions that any allocation strategy can implement. The first is placement, deciding where in the free memory or which free block can be used to give to the application when a request is made. Ideally, we wanna put the block in a place where it's not gonna cause fragmentation later, but this is generally impossible unless we have some kind of future knowledge or application-specific knowledge. The second is that we'd like to split blocks to satisfy smaller requests. This is gonna fight internal fragmentation. Imagine that we had a bunch of blocks that were 30 bytes in size, but we only needed 10 bytes. Well, it'd be nice to be able to split those up into 10 byte chunks that we can give to the application. We can choose any larger block to split, but again, this comes back down to the internal and external fragmentation we might cause through this choice. One way is this best fit strategy. We might choose this block with the smallest remainder once we split it. And the last choice that most allocation strategies will use is to decide when to coalesce free blocks to generate larger blocks. Imagine that you free two adjacent blocks. Well, we could figure out that the adjacent block is free and then try to coalesce those into a single larger block. So here, imagine that 20 and 10, they're both free. So we'd like to be able to coalesce them into a block of 30, making us have more freedom for allocation decisions in the future. Sometimes we're gonna do the coalescing immediately and sometimes we'll have to defer it to a later operation only when it's needed by the application. It's gonna trade off performance between the malloc and the free paths of the allocator. One thing important to remember here is that if we read the allocation literature to find the best allocator, there's no single answer. All of the discussions are gonna revolve around different trade-offs that can be made for different types of applications. 
There's al allocators designed for embedded systems and real-time systems, allocators designed for particular workload behavior, and specialized allocators like slab allocators and garbage collectors that all serve different purposes and have different benefits to the developer or to the memory and performance trade-offs that we can make. The main theoretical result is that for any possible allocation algorithm, there exists a stream of allocation deallocation requests that are gonna defeat the allocator and force it into severe fragmentation. How much fragmentation we tolerate depends on the workload. As we said, we'll show that in general, a bad allocator will be proportional to the ratio between the largest and smallest allocations made. A good allocator will be proportional to log of that same ratio, dramatically reducing the amount of wasted space for a given application. Let's look at a few pathological examples to see what, this, what happens. Given an allocation of seven 20 byte chunks, what set of frees and allocates is going to lead to some kind of bad scenario? If we freed every other chunk and then attempted to allocate 21 bytes, we'd have to grow the pool of memory because even though we have a bunch of memory available, we don't have 21 bytes contiguous anywhere. Also, given a 128 byte limit on malloc space, what can we see as a set of combination of bad mallocs and freeze that we can't really satisfy any more requests. There are a bunch of options here. Imagine that we allocate 128 one byte chunks and we freed every other chunk. Now we can't use half the space unless we only allocate one byte chunks. Similarly, we can think about the same thing with 16 four byte chunks or 32 two byte chunks and freeing every other chunk. All of these cases basically prohibit us from allocating any larger size once this is run. In the next part, we're gonna look at the best fit and the first fit allocators that in practice work pretty well. In most workloads, this usually requires about 20% fragmentation. In the next, in the next few slides, we're going to look at two basic strategies for allocation that are often building blocks for more complicated algorithms that we'll see later, the best fit and first fit strategy. In practice, these work pretty well. Where pretty well here means approximately 20% fragmentation under many workloads. So the first strategy is the best fit strategy. The best fit strategy minimizes fragmentation by finding the block that leaves the smallest fragment. So here the data structure for the heap is just a linked list of all the free blocks and we'll have a header that has the size of the block and a pointer to the next block. And the code simply just scans over this linked list looking for the block with the closest size to the actual request. If we find an exact match, we can return immediately. Otherwise, we'll scan to the end, finding the closest match. During free, we're going to try to coalesce any adjacent blocks so that we have the largest possible block in the free list at any given time. The main problem with the best fit approach is that over time, we're going to be left with a bit of sawdust, essentially tiny fragments throughout that we don't know what to do with. Fortunately, this isn't really a problem in practice. Sometimes it can be mitigated by having some sort of minimum size for allocation. So how can best fit go wrong? So we can find a bunch of pathological cases, but a, a simple one to think about is allocating as block of size N and then a block of size M in alternating order and then freeing all the Ns and then trying to allocate something slightly larger than n. So imagine here, we started with 100 bytes of memory. We alloc 
19 bytes, 21 bytes, 19 bytes, 21 bytes, 19 bytes. And then we freed all the 19 byte regions and we're left with 57 bytes of total space, but we can no longer allocate even a 20 byte region. While this seems like a simple example to come up with, in practice, this doesn't really match the way a lot of real programs behave. So fortunately, this doesn't usually pose a, main, a big problem to the best fit allocation strategy. Another strategy is the first fit allocation strategy. With the first fit strategy, we're just gonna find the first block that fits. So we could have a free list or some other sorted list or first in first out or sorted by address data structure that manages all of the free memory. And all we do is we scan the list to find the first block that matches. The nice thing here, this is gonna be much faster than best fit. We don't have to scan the entire list to look through all, of, all the free blocks in memory. We're just gonna grab the first one and we're gonna give that to the application, potentially making the allocation operation very fast. And sometimes this is also has other benefits. So if we use the last in first out policy where we put free objects on the front of the list and we try to reuse those objects immediately, we sometimes get better cache locality because we'll be reusing memory that has been recently used by the processor. Other strat strategies like sorting by address or first in first out might avoid some of the higher fragmentation of the last in first out but have other trade-offs um, that we can make. The last in first out, first fit allocation strategy is a nice example of the subtle choices that we can make during design that impact application performance. The last in first out, first fit, while it seems good, in the best case, freeing and allocating are going to just be pushing and popping to the front of this list. And the hope being that if we reuse similar sizes again and again, it's gonna be very cheap and it's gonna have good cache locality. The problem is that simple allocation patterns can often cause problems for this. Imagine intermixing again, two size patterns, a bunch of short lived two n byte allocations with some longer lived n plus one byte allocations. Each time one of these larger objects is freed, a small chunk will be quickly taken by these n plus one byte allocations, leaving a fragment that we can't really reuse. The first fit allocator sorted by address might seem a little odd at first, but if we think about it, it's actually operationally similar to a best fit allocator. The blocks at the front are preferentially split more often than the blocks toward the back of the list, unless we can't find a larger one before them. So the result is that we're gonna end up with a free list that's roughly sorted by size. So this is going to make the first fit allocator in this case very similar to a best fit allocation. We'll essentially scan for the first block large enough and generally the beginning of the list is gonna contain smaller blocks, the later list is gonna contain bigger blocks. The problem with this, similar to the best fit allocator, is that we're gonna end up with a lot of sawdust, particularly at the beginning of the list. Sorting the list forces the request to skip over many small blocks and we need to use a scalable heap organization to do this. Again, like anything else with allocation, depending on the workload, best fit or a first fit sorted by address will perform better than the other. So here in this example, if I just had 20 and 15 as two free blocks available, if the allocation operations were 10 and then 20, the best fit allocation strategy is gonna win the first fit strategy will be unable to satisfy it with just these two blocks. Can we find a case where the first fit is better? Of course. If we allocated eight, 12, and 12, 
in the first fit strategy, we'll split that first block into eight and 12, and we'll satisfy the immediate 12, and then the remaining 12 will be satisfied by the block that's of, that contains 15 bytes. In the best fit strategy, in this case, we would have tried to allocate the 15 byte block left over with seven bytes left, and then we would have gone to the 20 byte block and allocated 12 bytes with eight bytes left, and we'd have to allocate more memory to satisfy the last request. Generally, these are worse off strategies. One is the worst fit strategy. This basically tries to fight sawdust by splitting blocks to maximize the leftover size. But usually this doesn't seem to help any workload and, and this usually causes the problem where no large blocks are gonna be left around. Also, the next fit strategy where it's similar to first fit, but instead of starting the search from the beginning, we start from the search from where we last left off. This seems like this might be a good idea, but if we were sorting by address, we would always be looking through the list for blocks of a larger size. And also buddy systems. Buddy systems usually round up allocations to power of two to make memory management faster. So we might allocate blocks of 128 bytes and 256 bytes and 512 bytes and one kilobyte, two kilobytes, etc. The results of these buddy systems are that usually they have heavy internal fragmentation, but they are nice allocators and they're sometimes used in, in the initialization of operating systems. Now that we understand a little bit about memory allocation and we've got two basic algorithms that we can use to implement memory allocators, let's understand a little bit about common workload behavior patterns that we can use to make better allocation decisions. Sometimes these will be used to make specialized allocators for specific needs. After this, we'll dig into some details on several more advanced allocators and look at other memory management topics. So far, we've been treating programs as basically black boxes. So let's look at the program behavior to look at common patterns that we might see in allocation and freeing basically break it down into three main categories. Ramps, where we accumulate data over time and we don't really free it until the very end. Peaks, where we allocate many objects, use them briefly, then free them all and continually do this. And plateaus, where we allocate a bunch of objects and use them for a long period of time before freeing. In the ramps case, here I'm showing basically a rough trace of something like an LRU simulator. So this is simulating an LRU cache for a storage system. And over time, it's gonna use more and more memory to contain all the state that it needs for the system. In a ramp, there's basically no freeze. Often, we don't need to worry about fragmentation. We don't need to worry about most of these allocation issues because we can simply just keep allocating a bump pointer from a large pool of memory to satisfy the entire application's needs. A second common pattern, and here we're showing an example of a GCC compiling with optimization. And what happens is that the program runs through a bunch of phases. It first takes all of the source code and parses it into a bunch of tokens and then it creates trees, and then it flattens that out into some kind of internal representation of code, and various optimization and lowering passes eventually generate the final object file at the end. So each of these peaks that we see and troughs represent changes of the phases of the application. Here, fragmentation is a real danger because we are carrying over some objects some of the old objects stick around while we allocate new objects, and then we want to free all the old objects from the previous phase. We also should think about what happens if this overlaps with other things that we've seen? What if this overlaps with uh, a ramp? Or what if different workload patterns are interleaved somehow? Basically, with the peak phases, what we can do is we can use an arena strategy where we essentially create pools of memory that we allocate from. 
so that each phase essentially allocates and frees out of its own pool or arena. The advantage here is that inside of each of these pools, we are not going to waste any space and we can allocate these pools using just a simple pointer increment. This can work really well, especially for something like GCC, where we might have lots of allocations of the same structure, a structure that represents a token, a structure that represents a tree node, etc. A third phase is a plateau where the application roughly uses a constant amount of memory. It had some ramp at the beginning and some freeing that happens at the end. What happens if this overlaps with other plateaus or with ramps or with other operations going on in the application? One general strategy that we can use to fight fragmentation in this case, where we might intermix different parts of the workload, is using some form of segregation to reduce fragmentation. We can use two basic heuristics. First, that things that are allocated at the same time tend to be freed at the same time. And the second, that different types of objects are often freed at different times. So think of GCC, the objects represent tokens and represent trees. Those objects are created at different times and they tend to be freed together also, each of those types tends to be freed together when we're done with the tokenization phase and we've got a tree structure representing our source code, we might free those tokens. There's a lot of observations we can get from real world applications. One that programs often allocate a small number of different sizes. There's not a huge variety of sizes. The fragmentation of the peak is often going to be more important than in low memory use. And that most applications are relatively small. Let's put these heuristics together and our basic understanding of allocation from the beginning of lecture to look a little bit in detail into two allocation strategies that form the basis of a lot of common allocators out there. We'll first look at the slab allocator, and then we'll look at segregated list allocators. The first allocator is the slab allocator that was developed by Bonwick at Sun Microsystems while working the Solaris operating system. He realized two key observations about the operating system kernel, that the kernel allocates many instances of the same structure. We might have many task structures, many proc structures, many structures representing threads, many structures representing V nodes and files and devices that will all be repeated many, many times throughout the operating system. And the second was that often we cared about allocating these things in contiguous physical memory for being able to do direct IO to devices. The slab allocation optimizes this. And all it is, is that we allocate pools called slabs that contain multiple pages of contiguous physical memory and a cache that contains a pool of slabs. Each cache is used for only a single kind of object, right? It's fixed size. We have just the task struct or just the proc struct in a single instance of a slab allocator. And each of the slabs might be full, empty, or partially used. And we'll try to allocate out of these slabs through this cache interface. If there's a partial slab, we'll try to allocate the structure from that. If not, we'll go to an empty slab and we might even need to allocate a brand new slab. The advantage here is that allocations are incredibly fast. We're basically allocating out of just a few linked list structures. So these allocation decisions can be made in just a few cycles and there's no internal fragmentation because we know the size of all the objects in the slab. If you go and see the paper that's cited at the top in the title on my slides, he has a few nice ideas that he shows off in the paper that we don't really get into here. An additional thing is that when the kernel allocates structures, kind of like you do in C++, you have a constructor and a destructor that usually initializes and uninitializes 
the structure state. Some of that state can be reused across multiple allocs and frees of a structure. So in his work, he splits the constructor into two parts, an initializer that does some initial setup, and then the constructor that does the final setup for that individual use, and two parts for the destructor in the same way. This allows the slab allocator to not only benefit from these allocation decisions, but it also takes into account some of the work of doing constructions and destructions and trying to avoid fully destructing and reconstructing the object by reusing some of the state, if at all possible. This also contributes to a big reduction in the, in the overhead, the CPU overhead, for the slab allocator. There's some follow-up work that he did in a subsequent paper that also has some other applications to user space and general resource management that's pretty interesting. And I should note that the slab allocator isn't just used in operating systems today, it is used in many high-performance user applications and also it's the basis for some of the more advanced dynamic memory allocators that are in use today. A second class of dynamic memory allocators are ones that use a segregated free list. Usually this list will contain a bunch of buckets of small size objects, and these might be linearly spaced. Usually they're not power of two spaced the way a buddy of an allocator is. And each bucket contains a fixed size object, kind of similar to a slab allocator, but it's just a linked list of free objects anywhere in memory and allocations and freeze can happen off these lists. For larger allocations, usually we'll have different ways of dealing with them. We might have a tree structure, or in some cases for large enough allocations, we might directly ask the operating system for memory to mmap and unmap regions of memory for the application. The advantage here is that for each segregated size, we don't need any size tag, and it's very fast to do these allocations. The downside with this approach is in the worst case, we might waste an entire page of memory without freeing if we're not using a lot of objects per size. A lot of allocators are built on this. TC malloc is a well-documented allocator that uses this strategy. And there are extensions to this, for example, a two-level segregated fit used in embedded allocators, like the TLSF allocator. So one of the interesting things that we need to think about when we're creating the allocator is what are the space overheads associated with allocation and deallocation? Remember that we need some kind of free list and we need to store the size of the block typically. So what happens is that for each allocation, we usually need a tag that might be at the beginning of memory for each allocation that contains its size and then pointers to other blocks in the free list. So if we had on a 64-bit machine, we should expect that we're gonna need two eight-byte pointers and we're gonna need a size pointer that might be another eight bytes. So we could be using up to 24 bytes of memory just for this tag structure. Another, another source of space overhead is that structures need to be aligned. The allocator doesn't always need, know the type of a structure, so it has to align the size of the allocation to a conservative boundary that the processor will be happy with. This is more of a performance thing for x86, but for other architectures, this is actually a requirement for correct behavior. And remember that we also have the job where the application is working with the operating system to try to minimize its own memory use. And it does this by allocating and freeing memory back to the operating system. On older systems, as we discussed in the previous lecture, this can happen through S break or break. On modern operating systems, this typically happens through MMAP, MUnmap, and MAdvise, 
that'll tell the operating system what memory is in use, what memory is not, and whether or not it can unmap memory regions. So this brings us to one last thing that we should cover, which is garbage collection. Many of you programmed in Java, JavaScript, or other safe languages that use garbage collection to provide dynamic memory management. In these languages, typically the programmer doesn't have to worry about freeing objects. You only have to worry about the allocation, and this can still have an important performance impact on your application. Usually because of the allocation, the freeing process and how these, these systems work, we'll see that there are performance costs to the system where we have to stop the program to figure out what memory to free at some point when we're running out of memory. Application memory can grow very large if you're not careful. And applications sometimes have to put in mitigations to reduce these effects. The basic insight is that safe languages allow the runtime to know about all the pointers in the system. And if we know them and we can change them, we can move an object and update all pointers to point to the new location where an object is. This adds a new dimension to dynamic memory management. What memory locations might a program be able to access? Well, it starts in the CPU registers. Any object in the CPU registers or accessible indirectly through the CPU registers is accessible. Those include the stack pointer, which means all objects on the stack are indirectly accessible. Everything else is unreachable or garbage. These should be pointers that should be freed by the runtime. And a basic strategy that can be done to implement this is what's known as the stop and copy garbage collection algorithm. Here, when memory starts to grow and we believe that there's too much memory being used by the application, we can pause the program, stop it, and allocate a new pool of memory. And then we can go ahead and copy all the objects pointed to by registers into the new memory heap and mark the old objects as copied, pointing to the new location, and then scan through the new heap and update all the pointers to point to new copied objects. Anything not copied gets copied and we adjust the pointer. And finally, we can free the old heap. So here we stop the program, find all the objects that are still live, as they're usually called, copy them to the new heap and free the old heap after we've done all the pointer updates. And then we can resume the application execution. So the first problem we can see is that the stop and copy means that we have to stop the program for a fair amount of time to do all this scanning and processing. And this is gonna play out in terms of adding latency to your application. Imagine you're building a web application and you get a stop and copy. It means that your application is no longer gonna be responding to user requests while the world is stopped and the copy is occurring and all the pointer updating operations occur. And then we resume. If we think about this in terms of what happens on real runtimes, a lot of older garbage collectors in older versions of Java, all these have improved now, but could see stop times of tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds, which start to be noticeable to the user. This might make some of these languages unusable for game engines and for, for game runtimes or for other latency sensitive applications. But in the hundreds of milliseconds, this could even be problematic for just website users that'll get frustrated. So this brings us to the first optimization we can do, which is a common one, which is to have a concurrent garbage collector. There are a bunch of different ways that these have been optimized over time. Um, but the concurrent garbage collector basically says that we can stop and copy but we're gonna do this without really stopping the program. We're gonna allow the program to continue running, but every time the program wants to modify memory, we'll have to track those mutators, those attempts to modify memory, to ensure that changes are propagated to the new pool of memory that we've copied and that any pointers are properly updated and maintained. 
when the collector is invoked, what we can do is we can basically use the memory management tricks that we talked about from other lectures, call into mProtect and block all modifications to the old memory. Now we can start copying objects from that are pointed to by registers or the stack into the new pool and resume the program. A number of languages use reference counting as an alternative to garbage collection. Those of you who have programmed on a Mac or on the iPhone might have used Objective-C and Swift that use reference counting with some compiler assistance. And if you use C++ a lot, you might be familiar with C++ smart pointers like the shared pointer that do reference counting on objects and automatically free the object when all pointers are freed. Here, the idea is that every object just has a reference count, a count of the number of references to it. Whenever you copy a pointer to a new place, you're gonna increment that reference count. And whenever a pointer is deleted or, or killed, you'll decrement that reference count. So in this example here, if bar A and B, if we say A equals C, well, the C reference count, if all of these are references, the C reference count is gonna get incremented. And when we copy A to B, we're gonna increment again the A reference count. And when we set A to zero, we'll decrement the C reference count. And when we return here, we're gonna decrement the B reference count because the object B reference is going away. When the reference count hits zero, we can just free the object. This works well for a lot of hierarchical data structures and reference counting sometimes is used in kernel objects or in other applications where reference counting just makes it easier to manage memory. But reference counting can come with its own set of problems. One example where this is really tricky is with a circular data structure. With a circular data structure, where we have a loop created, there's always a reference. Even though there's no pointer from outside pointing to these three objects shown here, each one of these objects points to the other, giving each one a single reference, preventing them from being freed. There are a few ways that this can be dealt with. One is to allow some manual intervention by allowing you to notify the compiler of free one of these objects, or by clearing the individual references, allowing each of these objects to decrement the other's ref count. This can be potentially a better strategy than other garbage collector approaches. We don't need a, to halt the program to run the collector and we avoid those unpredictable performance penalties when the collector does its stop and copy operation. The downside though, the trade-off here, is that it's potentially less efficient than a real garbage collector. Remember that in a real garbage collector, when we copy pointers, we're just copying a pointer. It's a you know, four or eight byte value that can be copied in registers or memory, and nothing has to happen. With reference counting, we're gonna to have to increment and decrement each of those, those counters. And often that counter is gonna be an atomic variable or guarded by a lock. So this can be costly on the order of hundreds to thousands of cycles for reference counting operations. Hopefully today's lecture gives you a little bit of insight into the dynamic allocators that power malloc and free in C or new and delete in various programming languages and helps you understand the performance and memory trade-offs that can occur with different allocation strategies. It's not uncommon for higher performance applications to stick in custom allocators and specify which allocator they use. It's becoming more prevalent to see slab allocators and other things like that used in user space itself and we can find many example applications that ship with these different types of allocators to improve their own performance across different platforms.